Today we're going to look at entries 21 through 30 on the fake SNES that I accidentally bought a few months back. We'll see which games on here are new to me and which are the most random bootleg nonsense. I'm hoping for more of the latter since those are the most fun to discover, but also the least fun to play sometimes. It's a real emotional roller coaster, this thing. Now, reminder for this series, despite the appearance of the console, these are all NES and Famicom games. There are no Super Nintendo games. And I'm not reviewing the device here, I'm just exploring the library and seeing where it takes me. I'll play some games that are new to me and let you know if they're worth playing today. First up is number 21, Star Force. Now, I had Star Force as a kid. I played a ton of Star Force. I was terrible at Star Force, but I wanted to be good at Star Force. I would even borrow a friend's NES Advantage controller from time to time because it had a slow-mo setting, hoping I could get better at this game. I never did, but I still have a soft spot in my heart for this vertical shooter on the NES. At least I did until I loaded up some cheats and played through the entire game to see everything there is to see once and for all. I realize now that this is not a great shoot 'em up It's not even a decent one, really. There are 24 stages of mostly similar design where you fly through and shoot the most random enemies. Each stage ends with a boss battle against a square with a letter in it that doesn't do anything except fly away from you. The only real variety in the entire game comes from these faces on the surface of whatever planet space platform thing you're constantly bombarding. You have only one weapon. No screen clearing bombs, just one weapon. The sound effects are all very similar, most sounding like balloons popping instead of explosions. Like I said, it's quite repetitive and not visually interesting. I'm glad I finally got to see what it was all about, but I'm sad that it's not about much. Because when you finally reach the end, all you get is a commercial advertising the next entry in the series. Yep, a crummy commercial son of a bitch. If you're wanting a legal, modern way to play this version, you're out of luck. But the original arcade version is available on both the PS4 and Nintendo Switch via the Arcade Archive series. Now, I really find this next part fascinating. The 1984 Tecmo arcade game was ported to the Famicom by Hudson in 1985. But then two years later, a different version came to the NES directly from Tecmo. It's not entirely unheard of, but it is rare to have two different versions of a game between the Famicom and the NES. Not different localizations, mind you, different ports entirely. They're not radically different, but still, it's pretty neat. For example, the Famicom version doesn't have the commercial at the end, if I recall correctly. And for a property no one really seems to ever talk about, there sure were a lot of versions. Besides the arcade, Famicom, and NES versions, Star Force also came to the MSX, Sega's SG-1000, and the X-68000 computer system. There were two sequels, Super Star Force in 1986 and Final Star Force in 1992, which apparently was true to its word. It was remade for a compilation on the Super Nintendo and appeared on the original Xbox in the Tecmo Classic Arcade Collection, which was exclusive to that platform. And as I said, it's on the Switch and the PS4 now. The version on the fake SNES here has a comically slimmed down title screen, and that's the only difference I'm able to notice between this and the legit version. And because of that, I'm not entirely sure if this is the Famicom or NES edition. Now, maybe they substituted in something wacky for the commercial screen at the end, who knows? Not me, I'm never playing through this one again. Once was enough, and even that is pushing it. Next up is a Famicom exclusive release titled Sky Destroyer, another port of an arcade game. But even though the home version was only released in Japan, it is completely playable to anyone needing their games to be in English. You play as a Japanese fighter pilot in World War II, and now you know why it only came out in Japan. Thanks to some issues with my setup, I spent about three weeks doing a lot of testing, waiting for updates to fix certain problems I was having. And Sky Destroyer, since it was next on my list here, was the game I used for that testing. As such, I've now heard the intro music dozens and dozens of times, and it has permanently merged with the Indiana Jones theme in my head. It's 
It's an airplane shooter, much like games like Afterburner. However, there's just not much to this, and unless you're itching for some high scores or some retro achievements, I see no reason to get on board here. Not that you could, because neither version of the game is legally available anywhere. And the bootleg version here on the fake SNES just removes Taito's copyright info. Yiar Kung Fu, and I hope I'm saying that right, was a very popular arcade game in both Japan and here in the States in 1984 and 1985. However, when it came time to port it to home consoles, Japan was the only region to get a copy. You fight rounds against an enemy, there are life bars, all the beginnings of the genre are here. The Famicom version is a slimmed down version of the arcade game with fewer enemies, but the challenge is the same. Each of the first three enemies fights with weapons while you have none, and if you're not patient, this can make for a frustrating experience. This is one of those games that was ported just about everywhere. It received a sequel in 1986, was remade for Xbox Live in 2007, and the arcade version lives on via Arcade Archives on PS4 and Switch. The bootleg version here just appears to remove Konami's name from the title screen. Twice. Capcom's 1942 is a great shooter. I'd never played the NES port of 1942, but it is trash. It is hideous. It's embarrassing. There is no reason to ever play it. It looks awful, and it sounds awful. The bootleg version here just removes the copyright info. You're probably seeing better options to play 1942 on your screen right now, and you should really go with any of them over this one. Let's just move on. Ugh. The Desert Storm Cash Grab Gulf War 1990 is actually just a retitled version of 1988's Silkworm, which is best played as a two-player shooter where one player is a helicopter and the other is a jeep, and together you blow everything up. You can play it single player, but it is a lot more difficult that way, and you have to make a choice between the sweet chopper or the sweet jeep, and that decision is hard as well. Also difficult is the choice between heroes Robert and Stacy. Tough as nails hero names right there. It has some annoying graphical glitches that I thought were my setup, but no, it's just the game. Overall though, it's totally fine. You'll just have way more fun playing it in co-op. Back in the day, you had a lot of options to do that, as Tecmo's arcade game was ported to half a dozen different systems. But then after 1990 or so, it was never to be seen again. This NES version is fine, but I'd wager the arcade game is better. Maybe couch co-op through it with a buddy one evening. You'll have fun. The bootleg title screen adds in their new fake name, but also keeps the Silkworm logo, deleting the copyright info to make room. Kudos to the bootleggers, though, for matching their font to the rest of the game. Capcom's x Xs is a Famicom port of a Japanese arcade game which was known as Savage Bees in American arcades. The home version is a very slow, rather generic looking sci-fi shoot-em-up where you're blasting a lot of what appear to be bugs and various other critters while also collecting assorted fruits for points. You know, video games. I'd really like to shake the hands of the first designers who gave these games multiple weapon upgrades because without them, these things are a slog. I believe it's not until round four before you see any kind of upgrade here it's a trivial power-up, and by then you're probably not even playing anymore. And while this does feature some kind of smart bomb weapon, possibly that you get by collecting on-screen stars, I swear it doesn't seem to actually do anything. Sound effects are obnoxious, the music is repetitive, and the slowness of everything really completes the whole package of mediocrity. I'd bundle it right up with Star Force as a shooter that's just as generic as they come. The version here on the fake SNES again just wipes the copyright info. No copyright info means there's no copyright. It's genius. Exerion, and I think I'm saying that right, is a 1985 Famicom game based on the Jalico arcade game from 1983. It's a Space Invaders, Phoenix, Demon Attack, Galaga-like, except that you can pretty much roam around the entire screen, and the scrolling background gives you the impression of even more movement. And you're shooting down attacking... things. The enemy variety here is just a mismatch of designs. Also bizarre is the game's use of inertia as you move around. While it's an interesting idea, it makes the controls feel very slippery, for lack of a better word, and you really have to concentrate on where you're going to end up on screen. This home conversion kind of rubbed me the wrong way, as it is clearly using sound effects from Galaga. That's not cool, don't steal from Galaga. Aside from this version, Exerion also got ported to the SG-1000 and the MSX computer, 
the latter of which got its own sequel in 1984. Yet another sequel was released in arcades in 1987. It's weird how all these games have a legacy and then poof, nothing. Speaking of poof, nothing, all these ports, unavailable, but the arcade version is part of the Arcade Archive series on PS4 and Switch. The fake version here on the fake SNES, you guessed it, removes the copyright. Raid on Bungling Bay was an acclaimed 1984 computer game programmed by Will Wright, creator of SimCity and other beloved classics. It received a port to the Famicom in 1985 and to the NES in 1987. You're controlling a helicopter and you're tasked with blowing up factories on all these small islands, which alerts the enemies and really makes them mad. So while you're blowing up the next factory, you're being swarmed by enemy jets, helicopters, and tanks. And once that happens, pray for your ears. Sometimes they'll just go take it out on your aircraft carrier, and if that's gone, you're toast because you cannot replenish your weapons or repair your damage without it. Because you're in motion essentially the entire time, that means the screen has to constantly scroll, and that scrolling is incredibly jerky, which results in an unpleasant viewing experience. So in the end, it's a video game that's hard to look at and difficult to listen to. That kinda takes away the desire to play it. Maybe the computer version is more tolerable. I know to this day it is still beloved by many. This bootleg version removes the music from the game for some reason. There wasn't much music even, just this cool little bass line that was honestly the only part of the sound that I enjoyed. Another Famicom exclusive is next. It's Taito's Gyrodyne from 1986. Based on their 1984 arcade game, Gyrodyne is a vertical shooter where you're a helicopter and you're shooting. You've got air and ground weapons and you're able to curve your shot slightly when you bank your helicopter left and right. Sometimes you can pick up little dudes on the ground as you fly over them. At a glance, this might look and sound like that 1942 port, but it's better than that. Not great, not even good, but fine, totally fine. And it's interesting that there don't seem to be any boss encounters or level breaks. You just fly and fly and fly and shoot and pick up little dudes. The most notable thing about it really is how tiny each vehicle is. Little tanks, small planes, cute tiny zeppelins. You could have repackaged this as a Micro Machines game and I wouldn't have been surprised. Gyrodyne was also ported to MSX, Sharp X1, and PC8801 computers before, yep, disappearing entirely, never to be heard of again. Poor Gyrodyne. And the bootleg deletes the copyright info. Poor copyright. Number 30 is listed as Final Mission, and it's a tricky one because it is a different game in each and every region it was released in. First, Japan received a game developed by Natsumi called Final Mission in 1990. In North America, certain details were altered and the game was retitled SCAT, Special Cybernetic Attack Team. A truly bewildering choice. That version came out in 1991. Then in 1992, Europe got a slightly altered version from the North American game called Action in New York. I played the American version of the game for this review, even though the version here is the Japanese version. And maybe one day I'll check out the other two. You must destroy them. The Earth is counting on you. Good luck. And right away, I was able to determine that this is one of those games where I just want to turn on invincibility and see everything the game has to offer. So that's what I did. And it's neat. I'll leave the story differences for another time, but one notable change in the American version is that you choose between playing either as Arnold or Sigourney. Guess who they're meant to be? It's similar to Capcom's Forgotten Worlds, as you're just a person jetpacking through the air, but you've got a lot of firepower. I know I mention a lot about how games in this genre don't make you feel powerful. Well, you don't have to worry about that here. From the start, you're enabled with multiple weapons, and power-ups are plentiful throughout each level. You've got these two extra things rotating around you at all times, providing even more firepower and you can lock them into place when you want to target something specific. Along with feeling powerful, you also have a life bar, so it's not a one hit and you're done kind of game. However, just know that you only start with one life. Once the life bar drains, that's it, game over. You won't need to worry about all that though if you just load up cheats and play through it all as I did here. Doing so will probably take you 25 to 30 minutes, and again, 
co-op with a friend is the way to go. Pair it up with Silkworm and have a fun afternoon. Again, there are some very notable differences between all three versions. I'll come back in a later video and really get in depth with those differences. I think they're really interesting. But for now, I think we're going to stop there. The original plan was going to be games 21 through 50, but I didn't anticipate all of the first 10 games here to be games that were new to me or worth exploring. And I didn't want to risk wearing everyone out in case the shooter parade just keeps coming. I didn't expect 9 of these 10 games to all be from the same genre. There's a lot of kind of fun, obscure stuff on here in this batch. I realize it's mostly stuff they thought they could easily steal, but still, some lesser seen games that are legit releases and I'm glad for the dumb opportunity I've given myself here to discover some of them. I'll be back soon with more of these. We've got a very long way to go to get to all 660 of the games that are on here. So until then, um, let's play some games, which is what I was doing, but uh, you know what I mean, other games. Let's Let's play games, whatever games you want. Just we're going to take a break from this thing, but go play games.